All right. This week's classic interview. This has been requested by many, many people. A lot of people saying, David, you know, with someone like Donald Trump running for president, you should really interview John Perkins, the guy who wrote Tales of an Economic Hitman, because it is so relevant in thinking about how Donald Trump sees the economy as something to be used for his gain and his gain at the exclusion of the gain of others. And it actually turns out we interviewed John Perkins a couple of years ago. So we will go to my interview from March 12th of 2014 with John Perkins uh, about his work as an economic hitman. Take a look. I'm joined today by John Perkins. He's the author of Hoodwinked and also Confessions of an Economic Hitman. He describes himself as an ex economic hitman and also claims to have played a role in the process of economic colonization of third world countries. John, it's really a pleasure to speak with you. I, I find your background so interesting. Why don't we just to give the audience who may not yet be familiar with you a, a little bit of sense of your background, give us your background as an economic hitman and what that means. All right, David, thank you. Yeah, I, I, my official title was chief economist at a major consulting firm out of Boston. I had uh, uh, several dozen employees working for me. Our job was really to identify countries that have resources our corporations covet, like oil, then arrange huge loans to that country from the World Bank or its sister organizations. But the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country. They made a great deal of profit from that. Also, some of the wealthier people uh, benefited from these projects, things like electric systems, industrial parks, highways things that benefit very wealthy families but don't help the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity and can't get jobs in industrial parks because they don't hire many people. Yet the country would be left holding a huge debt they couldn't repay. And so at some point we'd go back and say, hey, you know, since you can't pay your debts, sell your resource, oil, whatever, very cheap to our co co companies without any environmental restrictions or social regulations, or privatize your public sector businesses, uh, sell them real cheap. Your, utility companies, your water and sewage system, your schools, your jails, off to our corporations. And in that way, we really created the world's first truly global empire, primarily without the use of the military. So you're really talking about so many you had you were directly exposed, in other words, to so many of the issues we talk about on this program and that corporate media often ignores, which are corporate control over the commons, the privatization of, of, of uh, uh, public goods and resources and so many of these other things. But at a certain point, did you have some kind of a realization that what you were helping to achieve was a negative thing? Or how did you transition out of that world? Well, it's a very interesting system, David, because in fact, in business school, I was taught that that's exactly what you should do. If you want to help a developing country grow its economy, you invest billions of dollars in infrastructure. And statistically, we can show that that works. The economy increases. But it, it, as I got deeper and deeper into this, and perhaps because I had been a Peace Corps volunteer before this, living with very poor people in Ecuador, I, I came to understand that the poor people were not benefiting, that the statistics uh, reflect the very wealthy, which is true in this country, too. We know that 85 people control more resources than half the world's population. Our statistics are very, very skewed to those rich people. So I very quickly... Uh, began to, or I shouldn't say very quickly, it took me a bit of time, but I yeah. discovered I discovered that, you know, our, our mission of helping the poorest of the poor was not working. We were doing exactly the opposite. We were helping the wealthiest of the wealthy. So how did you, what did you do? You quit your job, certainly, but how, what activist role did you take? Well, I first uh, started to write a book, which be eventually would become Confessions, and I contacted other economic hitmen and, and jackals. Jackals are the people that go in if the economic hitmen fail and assassinate or overthrow presidents. I'd seen this happen with two of my clients, a democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and the president of Panama, Omar Torrijos. They did not buy the system. They didn't listen to me, and they were both assassinated. So I quit my job. I, I started writing and contacting these people, and I immediately get serious threats on my life and my young daughter's life. At the same time, I was offered a, a, a job. I was taken out to dinner by the chairman of the board of Stone and Webster, another major big consulting firm. He said, hey, you got a great resume. I did. I've been chief economist of his rival. He said, we'd like to use your resume in our proposals. You won't have to do any work for us, and we'd like to pay you a half a million dollar consultant's retainer. Uh, just don't write the book. So, so here, 
Yeah, no, that, that's it. So then now we're kind of transitioning into the other thing I want to talk about. And I want to be very clear. I highly recommend everybody read your book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. They can also read Hoodwink. But really, we're talking about a lot of the stuff from Confessions. Not everything you've said has has uh, uh, avoided scrutiny and controversy. And I would love to get your reactions to some of the claims that are made by by State Department releases, which say that parts of your book, not insignificant parts are quote, total fabrications that your allegations about, for example, the NSA's involvement in economic policy is just completely made up. You know that you've been scrutinized significantly. Now, the obvious, the easy way to counter this would be for you to say, well, of course, they're going to say that because they don't want the truth getting out. And to me, I hope we can move past that kind of obvious rebuttal and really get your thoughts about what the reaction has been from the State Department to much, much of what you've written. Let me first start by saying that the New York Times did a major front page of the financial section uh, of Sunday, Sunday Times uh, on, on the book. And they, they vetted it very, very strongly and came to the conclusion that it was, it was truthful. Um, the State Department, I found out why they, they, they created a, a blog, or rather at that time a website, called the Misinformation Website, and my book was the only thing on it. Hmm. And it was puzzling to me because it, it sold a lot of copies of the book for me. And they did. They made the allegation that, the, that I claimed that I'd been recruited by the National Security Agency, which I was, and that that was ridiculous because the National Security Agency only does cryptography, encoding and decoding messages. Well, even back then in 2005 or so, we all knew that NSA did more than that. And now we, especially, we, we certainly, certainly know that they, that they do more than that. What were the circumstances of this re uh, recruitment attempt? Uh, well, first of all, I was married to a woman whose father was very high up in the Department of the Navy in Washington. One of his best friends was high up in the National Security Agency. I was looking for a job that would keep me out of Vietnam. And so he arranged for me to be interviewed by the NSA. That would do it. And uh, they put me through extensive testing, days of, of psychological testing, including lie detector tests, uh, and, and concluded that I would make a good economic hitman. What and, kind? I'm interested in this. What other kinds of psychological tests did they put you through? Well, there were written tests, there were interviews, there were lie detector tests. Um, that's about it. You know, yeah. I mean, lot, lot, you know, I, I was I was in a in a room by myself with lots of desks, right? You know, writing this thing with books around me. Uh, I, I'm sure there are cameras watching me. You know, the whole the whole routine. Okay, so so that that's one side of it. The other thing, and I'll just ask you directly: the State Department claims that you believe the government was complicit in the assassinations of JFK. Robert F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, John Lennon, and unnamed U.S. senators who have died in plane crashes. Is that something you allege? No, it's I've not. Never, I've never alleged that. I, 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 I probably opened the question as to whether that might have had been that way. What I have alleged, though, is that we were involved in the assassination of Jaime Roldos of Ecuador and Omar Torrijos of Panama, because I was there, I know. We've admitted that we were, that we took out Allende in Chile. Henry Kissinger's admitted it, mm. and and uh, Arbenz in Guatemala, and Lumumba and Diem and Mossadegh in Iran. We've admitted to many many of these things. And I also wanted to go back, Dave, David, for just a moment to to the State Department uh, yeah. thing. I, I always wondered why they did that website because right. um, it sold a lot of books for me. And I found out later through through a, a, a good friend who was also a host of a major show in Athens who did a show on me and was called into the Athens, Greece, uh, U.S. Embassy, uh, called on the carpet for doing that show. And the ambassador said, it puts me in a very embarrassing position because people come in and ask me, is Perkins' book real? Is it, is, what, is our, what is your official position on it? He said, I don't have one. I don't know what to say. Well, I believe that a lot of diplomats around the world were asked that question. So the State Department felt that it had to come out with an official statement uh, that negated the book, and that's why they did what they did. And they, it got their, their diplomats off the hook. They could just say, hey, the official position is on, is on our website. Don't ask me any more about it. And it sold a lot of books for me. Very quickly, just in the last minute we have left here, I would love to just get your opinion on when you look at the United States right now and the influence that big corporations and big banks have over every everybody's everyday lives in terms of the political system, the economic system, resources, et cetera. 
What's your biggest concern? In other words, in which area do you think we're closest to the tipping point for things really taking a turn for the worst? Well, I think what we know is we've created a death economy, one that's based on killing people, militarization, and, and ravaging the earth. We need to move into a life economy that's based on cleaning up pollution, feeding starving people, developing new technologies for transportation, communications, energy, etc. And we've been moving more and more in a very bad direction. We've created an economy, a global economy, that's an adject failure. Less than 5% of us live in the United States. We consume almost 30% of the world's resources while half the world's starving. That's not a model. Can't be repeated by China, even though they're trying. It just puts the world in a worse con condition when, when other countries try to repeat our model. We must come up with a new model. And, uh, I, and I think the corporations, that, the heads of corporations that are really smart are understanding this. I recently was invited to be the lead-off keynote speaker at a conference of 2,000 business executives in Istanbul. I get those invitations fairly frequently. I think business is beginning to get it. I think consumers are beginning to get it. I think we're truly in a consciousness revolution, a huge revolution where people are waking up to the fact that we're living on a very fragile space station that has no shuttles. We're going to have to take care of this place, and big business is going to have to play a major role in waking up and taking care of this, serving a public interest, not the 1%, but the 99%, serving the earth, in essence, and, and we all need to get out there and make sure that happens. We've been speaking with John Perkins. The books are Hoodwinked and Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Really great to have you on. I do appreciate it. Thank you, David. And I'd like to encourage people to go to johnperkins.org and sign up for my newsletter and see where I'm going to be speaking so I can meet them personally.